I've been receiving the number 1011 from Father and he guided me to Psalm 101 verse 1 that says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. And this is exactly what this teaching is about, both mercy and judgment. Father gave me a related dream that I would like to share with you now. Someone asked me in this dream whether I was fasting, and I said no. She said that they were being careful not to eat anything in front of me because they thought I was fasting. I noticed that she was extremely thin-looking, anorexic. She looked like someone pining away because of worry. Standing next to her was someone with the same jacket on as her, just another color. There was also another person in this dream who smiled at me. This person has written me off and in my dream I was wondering why he was so friendly with me. At some point his wife called me over but ignored me and then I saw him on a tennis court joking with his wife that he is about to be annihilated on the court. And that's the dream. So I woke up from this dream at 5.22 and knew that I had to look it up in the Strong's Concordance. It is used in a scripture found in all three synoptic gospels and all about the same subject, which is the Pharisees asking Yeshua why his disciples are not fasting. He replied that they need not fast whilst the bridegroom is with them, but they indeed will fast when he is gone. So it was clear that Father wanted me to fast for these individuals in my dream. What makes this request significant is that the two that two of the people in my dream have received a word of judgment from the Lord that he gave through me and this lies at the heart of why he wanted me to fast for them. If you're interested in some guidelines about fasting, please see the two related teachings on the teachings page on our website. One is called When You Fast wherein I give some key points and wisdom on fasting that Father has given me through the years. And then the other one is called Fasting in the Secret Place. Okay, so coming back to the dream. The first person in my dream is someone who has turned away from the Lord but thinks that she's still serving Him. In other words, she's convinced that she is still in a relationship with Him while still living as the world. And most of, all, of, of us you know, know someone more or less to the same degree. Now, she recently went through a very traumatic event where she and her household were held at gunpoint by five men and were robbed. Fortunately, nobody was harmed. She and this person with her in the dream had the same jacket on, which points to someone she knows who has also gone through a traumatic event. This is why they had similar jackets on and Father wanted me to intercede for both. Being so thin and to the point of looking anorexic speaks of a slow death setting in. And that's exactly what anorexia is, right? A slow death. So I told her about this dream and I asked her if there was someone else she knows who has also gone through a tra traumatic event like she did. This was indeed the case. Her boyfriend's daughter, who was there the same night they were robbed at gunpoint. She was in the bath when the robbers came, so fortunately they did not harm her. However, this girl is now in rehab due to drug addiction and is obviously going through a very difficult time emotionally. They definitely have the same jacket on, so to speak. So the man in the dream smiling at me on the tennis court, laughing and joking about being annihilated, is someone who has written me off in real life and he is a reference to being taken to court and being found guilty. The annihilation points to judgment being imminent, but he's making a joke of it or not taking the judgment seriously. At this time, this person wrote me off. Father gave me a word to give him wherein he said that unless this person returned to the pure word of God and repented, he would cause him to fall to the ground and the purposes of his life will be scattered to pieces. 
He also showed me a vision at this time of a pocket watch falling to the ground and breaking open with all of the inside of it scattering. The pocket watch is a reference to time, which represents his life and that the vision had an appointed time. So Father also gave me a word about five years ago for the first person in this dream, the one with the other person having the same jacket on. At that time, when she was very close to the Lord, she suddenly turned away back to the world. Having just been divorced, she could not handle being alone anymore. Soon she found someone else who loved her dearly. And the problem was that they were fornicating and she very quickly slipped away from the Lord back to her old ways. So in this regard, Father also gave me a vision of her and this new man walking naked and doing so before other people, which simply meant that they were unashamed. When I prayed about this, Father took me to Revelations 2, where the church of Ephesus was told that unless they re returned to their first love, that he would remove their candlestick. This meant the light and life in them would go out. So I had to give her this word of judgment. I love her dearly, and this was not easy, knowing that I could lose her forever. And in the end, she still has not changed, and I can testify that she's gone through much trauma in her life since then. It was by no means easy to give these warnings and judgment to these two people, and there was great cost involved. In this recent dream, Father is saying that these words which he had spoken are coming to pass. It had been five years since those words were spoken, but he has set an appointed time for these visions, words given to both of them to be fulfilled, and it has now come. Five is the number of grace. Though they thought that it would not come, thinking me a foolish woman, God will not be mocked. So in Habakkuk, the prophet is told to write the vision down and run with it, for it will surely not tarry. The vision he was given was that of calamity and devastation of Israel. And he had to write it down. Let's read that. That's in Habakkuk 2. Let's read verse 1 to 3. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say to me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not Terry. Now God is saying that much time will pass before this judgment comes, but we should wait for it. It will speak and not lie. Note, Habakkuk says that he will watch to hear what the Lord wants to say. So he's expecting a vision that will give a clear message. The whole of the book of Habakkuk is a dialogue between this prophet and his God. He is shown a vision of devastation coming, and this breaks his heart. He realizes that God is raising up the Chaldeans to come against his people, and it is indeed God's doing. Habakkuk is to write the vision down and make it plain. It says that the person who reads the vision then runs with it. Now, scholars say that this is as a billboard along the way which someone passes, and as they do, they see this as they go, which is to run with it. It's not Habakkuk running with it, but those who see or read it. So it's interesting that in chapter 1, Habakkuk asks the Lord why he shows him iniquity and then judgment does not go forth. Basically, he's asking the Lord, why show me if you're not going to do anything about it? It grieves the prophet how this iniquity is going on, referring to those who are coming against Israel. He laments and says in Habakkuk 1 verse 4, Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth come pass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. 
This is when the Lord God tells Habakkuk that though he sees how the enemy is taking over, it's indeed his judgment on Israel. Let's read that from verse 6. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are also swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. This very scripture is now starting to play out. Not only the judgment coming upon Israel, but on the whole of the world. War is indeed imminent. And it's a matter of a very short time where this world will be baptized in utter chaos. The book of Habakkuk is pointing to the seals period of the tribulation and should be read in conjunction with Psalm 18 from an end times understanding. Yeshua told us in Luke 21 from verse 20, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written, may be fulfilled. Let's face it. Why would this warning be any different than all the other times you have heard it? Is it not the fir- it's not the first time that Israel is composed about. And this is the point. For almost 2,000 years, we have heard that the Lord's return is imminent. This is how long we and the generations before us have heard the same thing about Israel and his return. This is because scripture is our billboard, and those who read it run with it. Prophecy is God's billboard, so to speak. And I'm running with it, and the clear sense and warning Father is giving me, not only through the dream given, but in my spirit is, judgment is coming. The appointed time is here. Why did he choose to warn his people for so long? Because from the moment you hear it to the appointed time of fulfillment is grace. I've often said to people who are disappointed when he does not come at a set date as expected that it's a mercy and a grace because many can still be saved. A mercy for those who hear or read it to repent even as this teaching is today. Just as with the case with those in my dream. I knew that the moment I spoke those judgments was the moment when God's clock started to tick. And he's showing me now is the appointed time for the visions. In the book of Revelation, we read about the different horsemen. Who is the one releasing the horsemen? God is. And they are his appointed horses of judgment, not only over Israel, but also over this whole world. In Habakkuk 1, the Lord refers to the Chaldeans' horses. The horses released during the tribulation serve him, just as the Chaldeans at the time were used by him as judgment. The red horse rider in Revelation 6 is the horse that represents war. Red is a reference to blood, and in the Strong's Concordance it refers to fire, in a way a fiery horse with a sword, all pointing to war and bloodshed. It says a great sword was given to him to remove peace from the earth. We also read about the red horse rider with his troops in Zechariah 1. Let's go there to verse 8. Zechariah says, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there red horses, speckled and white. 
Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Note that the horses walk, they are not running. It's as if they are doing an inspection of the earth. They find it to be still and at rest. All the peace has not yet been removed. In the context of war all over the earth, the earth is not yet in chaos as one would expect during a world war. The angel tells Zechariah that the horses are sent by God to go all over the earth. They are speckled, and speckled in the Strong's means to hiss. A snake hisses, which points to deception and slander. Indeed, we are seeing nations coming against nations as forewarned on a global basis. In other words, it is to incite to war, as this is the purpose of the war horses being sent to walk to and fro through the earth. My personal opinion is that this is exactly what is happening now. They are walking to and fro through the earth. Full-scale world war has not yet happened, because in a general term, great parts of the world are still at rest. However, if we follow the news... We clearly see that something big is coming, bigger than what we have seen thus far in any war in history. Once the red horse rider is released by God, World War III will break out. This is to set the stage for the Antichrist and global financial collapse. When we read Zechariah 1, we can clearly see in this chapter that judgment is imminent. Of course, even though God uses the nations to bring forth judgment, he is by no means pleased with them. After they fulfill the vision and it's at its appointed time, God will have his way with them, for they were indeed the willing participants to destroy the apple of his eye and slaughter the nations. And this is God's answer to Habakkuk, that although he sees iniquity abound, judgment will not come short as he said, but rather the days of vengeance will come as its appointed time, as per Luke 21, just previously quoted. So he has set an appointed time to deal with them. The seal period of the tribulation is God's judgment on the whole earth, including Israel, where they will be dispersed all over the world. They are told in Luke 21 to flee and not enter into Israel. Yeshua told us that not one stone will be left upon another. In fact, she will become as dust. She will be rebuilt but first she has to be utterly destroyed. I first mentioned that Father led me to Psalm 101 verse 1, where David says that he will sing of God's mercy and judgment. In the next Psalm, Psalm 102, David draws a picture of what they have endured in this judgment. You will recognize the significance of these words in light of the Holocaust that already took place, and we should understand that this devastation will be again. The word tells us that that which was shall be again. So Israel has been attacked many times in history and been brought to desolation. The word says that there are many antichrists. Indeed, there has been Pharaoh, Herod, Nero, Stalin, Hitler, and the list goes on. These are all types and shadows. They play out in real life, but at the end, there will be the final and actual fulfillment of the types and shadows, in a way, the last devastation of Israel and the last Antichrist. There will be a final devastation of Jerusalem and a final Antichrist. Not just for Israel, but the whole of this world. After all, it is God doing the judgment. But this time, on all who forsook him, the Creator. So please note the description in the beginning of Psalm 102 given of this physical body. I see now that this represents the woman in my dream being so thin, pointing to judgment. Also note that this psalm starts with this judgment and then it goes over to God's mercy. So there is a set time for judgment and a set time for mercy. So let's read Psalm 102 starting from verse 1. 
Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thy ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burnt as an earth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and I'm as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. My enemies reproach me all the day, and they that are mad against me are sworn against me, for I've eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shall endure for ever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and favor the dust thereof. I don't want to read the whole psalm. But you get the point. So it goes from judgment to mercy. And they both have an appointed or set time. Can mercy come without judgment? What is the purpose of God's judgments? Is it to punish or is it because having extended grace for so long, the time has come to bring the nations to their knees that they will cry out to him as dust? course there's a final judgment at the end known as the last day they have not listened thus far but have rather hardened their hearts and made their necks stiff scoffing at his true prophets and worshiping other gods in the time of grace the whole world is still under grace but will soon be brought under his heavy hand of judgment Just as Yeshua in John 8 wrote in the sand, which is a judgment as per Jeremiah 17, that those who forsake the one true God will have their names written in the sand. When the tribulation happens, he will have then drawn that line in the sand, for the only one worthy to cast the first stone is him. Stoning is judging. By extension, even his judgment will then be a mercy until the fullness of the Gentiles have come during the seal spirit of the tribulation, because in that time they will cry out for mercy. Psalm 103, after Psalm 102's judgment and cry for mercy, is all about the mercy of God. So in context to the dream and the subject matter being mercy and judgment, Father wanted me to pray and fast for the very people he had me speak a judgment over because the time has come for the fulfillment of it. So I'm sure you can understand that he would not ask this of me if there was anything in my heart towards them that speaks of unforgiveness, judging them or bitterness. My heart has to be pure towards them because if not, then my prayers will not be answered. So in Psalm 102, The type and shadow of Jerusalem's destruction, she is brought to dust. It says the following in verse 13. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. There is a set time for judgment and a set time. Time for mercy. It says that the Lord's servants take pleasure in her stones and they favor the dust. These servants are the Lord's bond slaves, male and female, and also refer to the Lord's prophets. It comes from the word Ebed from H5647 in the Strongs, which means laborer or worker. It also means Levitical service pointing to priests. Who will have pity on her stones that have been brought to dust? The workers, his priests. 
The word pleasure means to favor her as well. So dust is a reference to both the literal Israel being destroyed, but also we were made of dust, pointing specifically in this context to the Jew. So we cannot lose out of sight the fact that the Gentiles were grafted into the natural olive tree, being wild olives, to provoke the Jews to jealousy. They still have yet to be provoked to jealousy. God says that he will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy, referring to the Gentiles, a people who were not his people, whom he now calls his people. So this is the purpose of the workers in the time to come, to be a mercy unto all in the wilderness of the tribulation, both Jew and Gentile. In a time of judgment, he will bring mercy. My mentor, Arthur Cutts, said the following with regards to Psalm 102. He said, How do you know, however hopeless things may seem, there is a set time? There is a moment of God's choosing in which the most hopeless situation or predicament will be reversed and turned around. Its purpose will have been served. And because you know that, that God's final word is mercy and not judgment, that the experience that you are suffering is not the last word. There is something to come that must come in God's time. There comes a time when that purpose is served. So obviously we can take this on a personal uh, basis, but also referring in the time to come. I recently watched a historical series about a young king who had a very close friend who was his trusted confidant. Through the years, this king was very forgiving towards his friend whenever he did wrong and extended much grace. And at one point, the king could no longer overlook what his friend did, as it included persecuting his bride as well. This friend now kneeled before him, realizing his fate. There was no getting out of it. The set time of judgment has come. The king told his friend in great indignation that he is to be killed. There was no mercy for him any longer. Suddenly, the king's guard rushed to the king's friend's side and kneeled next to him. Earnestly, he begged for mercy for the king's friend. The king was furious with this guard, asking, What are you doing? This action itself being considered as going against the king's judgment and therefore undermining his authority, which could get him killed as well. However, the God, knowing the king's heart, looked at the king and said, Is this not what you wanted? Is this not secretly what you were hoping for? That someone would ask for mercy for your friend. Immediately the Spirit came over me and I cried so much understanding clearly that God is saying that He seeks those who will stand in the gap and pray for mercy for those who deserve judgment. Grace was extended in this TV series, but scorned. It was after this that He gave me the dream about the two people I've spoken a word of judgment over asking me to pray for mercy. At that moment, watching this program, I understood that his friend could no longer be excused. There was no longer anything in him nor anything that he could bring to the table that would stay the king's hand of judgment and convince him to pardon him. The time has come. However, someone who can intercede on behalf of his friend is someone he trusts and loves dearly, who has never left his side, his guard. Because looking at the God, his right-hand man, all he could see is someone he loved dearly and had not done him wrong. He was without guile. In Isaiah 58, the prophet gives a word from God addressing their fast and how he seeks not the fast that they do in order to be seen. He then begins to address the issues of the heart, that their hearts are not right with him. He is furious with them and wants them to repent. Now let's see what he says to them in chapter 59, from verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, 
that he will not hear. He's basically saying the problem is not that I cannot save or that I cannot hear, but rather because of your wickedness, I do not want to save you and I do not hear your cry. He's saying, that's it. I've had it with you. You will not repent. Verse 3, for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue have muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Isaiah writes further about how they are surrounded and experience hardship and trouble, but there is nobody to save them. That's in from verse 9. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us, for our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. They are guilty, and they know it, and they realize that God is not helping them. Justice standeth afar off. This, however, still displeases the Lord, because Isaiah 30 tells us the following in verse 15, for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. He then says, And ye would not. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee. And we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they pursue you. Be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. God is a God of judgment, meaning that he does not overlook things. He sees the oppressed, the poor, the weak and hurting. He sees it all and he sees those who cause it as well. He will not be silent. He is glorified or exalted in showing both judgment and mercy. He's telling them, fine, continue on your rebellious path and you will see how at the end you will become a sign unto others because of your folly. And I will wait until you return unto me in quietness and confidence that you will again trust me and wait on me to show you mercy. Because it displeased the Lord that justice was standing afar off and that nobody stood for justice, he says the following in Isaiah 59 from verse 15. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. This means nobody cried out for justice, nobody asked for mercy. And because of their iniquity standing between them and him, so that he would not hear their cries and did not want to save them, he says the following in verse 17. 
For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and he was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. He then cloaked himself in vengeance against his enemies, but at what cost for Israel? The Lord will indeed return with a cloak of vengeance again when he comes on the mountain made without hands, Mount Zion. And the rulers of this earth will cry out for the rocks to fall on them in great fear. After the fifth seal has been opened, we hear those under the altar crying out to the Lord in Revelation 6. Let's read from verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to? To stand. So at this point, I want to share a related word Father gave me. I received this on the 5th of July in 2022. And I believe this is a word that he is saying to us now with regards to the time we are in. The appointed time. Surely that which I have preordained is about to come to pass. Even that. Of your own life, the words I've spoken over you. For every word has its appointed time. As time passes and will be no more, know that I have an appointed time for all I have said to be, manifesting my purposes for this world through my appointed ones. It is for an appointed time that the clock of this world is ticking. However, Though the enemy thinks it is his time, it is in fact my time. Have I not said that there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven? A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time of war and a time of peace. I make all things beautiful in its time. My eternal clock is not outside of me, but is in me and you are in me in eternity even now. I will use my instruments of war, my horses sent out to fulfill my purposes at their appointed time. Both my horses of destruction, of which you have read in the book of the Revelator, as well as my valiant horses prepared for such a time as this. They will conquer, not in their own strength, for they have none, but will be strengthened by my spirit to run the race set before them. Even so, know that there is an appointed time for peace, not the peace of this world, but mine. Therefore, 
knowing the peace that I will crown you with and fill you with, knowing the joy set before you, set your face as a flint to endure to the end. I will not forsake you. I will never forsake you. No one has greater love than he who lays his life down for his friends. You are my friends. Let us ride, therefore, in the strength of the Spirit, enduring all things for my Father's kingdom. An appointed time for all things. I know the thoughts that I have for you and have not and will not forsake them. My words written in your book of life shall come to pass in its time. Time to gird up your loins and set your face as a flint to finish the course. Run to obtain the prize. Strengthen the feeble knees and set right that which causes you to falter. If not, you will fall behind and it will become a snare. Not only to fall behind, but if possible, to not finish your race. Have I not said that if possible, even the elect will fall away? Woe to those who think they stand, who teaches others, yet compromise with sin. As Joseph ran from temptation, so run from the snares set before you. Great testing and trials will be your portion on this last stretch of this race. Will you endure when you are still ensnared with petty sins? Will you endure when the cares of this world bear down upon you? Cast your care upon me and let us run together and finish the race. This brings me to the fact that in the time we are now in, just before the tribulation starts, we find ourselves in a time of grace. There are those who scorn this grace and dismiss it for this world. However, there are those who earnestly seek and desire him alone. Those who have forsaken all and bear their cross daily. They are a strange people in this world, considered weird and boring. They do not do the things of this world and are not of this world. In this time of grace, they did not harden their hearts. And he saw and he sees every time their heart breaks when they sin. Every time they pray and wait upon him. He sees how he is indeed their first love. And how they have laid their lives down to follow him. And out of these ones he has chosen a remnant seed to go forth in the name of the Lord. For they were willing to be judged by God. So that they may know his mercy. They themselves have been brought to dust and raised by him. They know that they are dust and undeserving of his mercy. Them he taught on the highway of holiness by his spirit. Them he led through their own personal wilderness. And them he has set apart for such a time as this to be sent into the wilderness of the tribulation. We read of how in the wilderness there is a remnant speaking to those who feel that God has forsaken them, extending mercy unto them. It's a mercy extended to those who once persecuted this remnant, a mercy extended to those who once looked down on his workers. They will want to know how it is possible that they have hope in a time of judgment, and this will indeed provoke them to jealousy. In fact, it will open their blind eyes. Let's read that. That's in Isaiah 35. Let's read from verse 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense, and he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. 
and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go upon thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I thought about the hardship I've gone through in my life and how very difficult the sanctification is that he uses to prepare us. In one word, it is the cross, because the cross is both God's judgment and his mercy. And those who allow God to judge them now will be able to extend the mercy they need. It's for this that he is preparing his workers, for he came to save the lost. Who can be more lost than those who will be left behind? Who can be more lost than the Jew who feels forsaken by his God, who has been brought to ashes, destitution, like a sparrow alone on a rooftop, mourning sore like doves, feeling there is no justice? For this, his workers are a voice in the wilderness crying out to repent. And can we extend mercy when we ourselves have not been apprehended by that mercy? This is not in the context of salvation alone, but it is seeing everything you have and what you are going through as a mercy. It takes a different kind of seeing to be able to see your suffering as mercy. This kind of seeing sees your whole life in this light. You do not take things for granted and you do not demand or throw a tantrum when things do not go your way. Why? Because you know him. You know that there is no one good but God, in whom is no shadow of turning. This means that he is not one day for you and another against you. This means that he is not playing you and manipulating your life for his purposes. You are not at his mercy, but in his mercy. He is altogether lovely, and what he subjects you to, whether good or bad, is a mercy. He is not just extending mercy, but he himself is mercy, just as he is love and truth. When you come to this place, you are, as Proverbs 21 says in verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it, whithersoever he will. In this place, there is a fluidity. There is no resistance, but trust. This does not mean there is no suffering, but what it means is that in the suffering, There is quietness, never feeling forsaken by God, never questioning his motives and never getting angry with him. You're still and know that he is God. You're not a pawn, you are his child. And he proves himself faithful to you at his set time, the set time of favor. Once again, there comes a time where what he has allowed in your life has served its purpose. He determines the length of it. You learn to love him equally on the mountain top as you do in the valley. I remember about 12 years ago, I was so angry with him. I understood the whole premise of why he allows suffering in our lives so that through this suffering, that which is in the heart is revealed and can be addressed. So it's the very fire needed to purge. But I had depression and my circumstances were unbearable. My self-pity crown was firmly set on my head and I was angry with him. In honesty, I say to him that I find him cruel to say he loves us and then subjects us to circumstances where we cry to him to be released from. If he is loving, why does he not answer the prayer for help? told him he's cruel for allowing this in my life just so that he can teach me something. Did he get offended by my honesty? Oh, of course not. He knew what was in my heart even before I knew. But he will rather deal with honesty than a religious spirit that makes as if none of these things move you. 
Yes, Paul said that none of these things moved him, but he spoke from that place of understanding the mercy of God in all he suffered, both for himself and for those he ministered to. He could be all things for all men, Jew and Gentile, because his heart was in the hand of God. My circumstances did not change. In fact, they became worse. But I changed. And herein lies the crux of the matter. It's not in the absence of suffering, but in suffering he extends mercy. Yes, it's a mercy when our prayers are answered, and it's a mercy when things go better. However, it's in the wilderness that he extends mercy to us to endure, to love, to embrace, to forgive, and to let go. We want our circumstances to change, but he wants our heart to change. There cannot be a greater contrast than between Jew and Gentile. How can I say it? To be Jewish is to be totally other. They stand in contrast to the whole of this world. We're talking about an almost 6,000 year history of God's dealing with them that has come through generations and God has chosen to be their God. He chose to come as a Jew. He was sent to them, but they did not recognize him. We read about that in John 1 verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. This is not to say that he is not our God, for the whole earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell therein. But he has not only chosen them, but also chosen to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Even our salvation is for the purpose of provoking them to jealousy. There's something about a true Jew who is able to see a phony a mile away. They have a sense of that which is real and to meet them in the wilderness having to say, Jesus loves you, will not cut it. There will have to be a demonstration of that love through mercy. I will meet you in the wilderness and there speak to you face to face, is what he told the Jews and is still saying for what is to come. By your mercy, they will obtain mercy, he tells the Gentiles. This face that they will see is his reflection, his very image in us. The mercy he will extend to the lost during the tribulation is to look into the faces of those who have met him in their own personal wilderness and they will have spoken to him face to face. They will have met him on the mountaintop coming down with the glory of God on their faces. What their faces will express is the heart of God. Will they see a face reflecting his mercy unless we have gone into that place of judgment that leaves one at the mercy of God? Will they see the face of God? Can we even understand mercy without judgment? And is not our understanding of that mercy in proportion to his judgment over us? Do I know what mercy is and have I entered into the very essence of that word? God is mercy and that mercy flows from only one place, judgment. Because at the mercy seat we find both God's judgment and mercy so can we have the one without the other? How much mercy will I be able to give if I have not been emptied so that mercy can flow out of me? I will, run, will I run dry at the first encounter? If they did not recognize him when he was sent to them at first, what makes us think it will be a walk in the park for us? These are a stiff-necked people. Only a demonstration of the cross on the faces of those who allow God's love to transcend all things will be a testimony even without using words. When Father asked me to pray for mercy for those mentioned in my dream, I asked him, what is it about them that you still want to save them? I wanted to know his heart. After all, why not move on? Fine, if they don't want to return to him and to the purity of his word, then let them go. It's their choice. So many other children of God who love him with all their heart. Why go to the extent of preparing workers by allowing them to go through so much to save those who do not want to be saved or are not even aware that they are lost? Why not just move on? Word says that it is not the will of God that anyone should perish, but that all should come to salvation. 
But why? What kind of love is this that knows all things and still wants to save? Have you ever thought of it? He hears and sees everything all the time. He sees every abortion, every murder, every form of abuse, every form of theft that leads to millions starving, every form of governmental manipulation and abuse and satanic sacrifices, and the list goes on. For how long has he been seeing it and hearing it? This God who gave his own son and is still being ignored, rejected, dismissed and blasphemed. How is it possible that he stays his judgment? I can only think it's for one reason. The intercessor. The blood of his son. The atonement on that mercy seat that will not deny anyone calling out to him. No matter what gutter or in what filth they've lived in. No matter whether they are a satanist, a molester, a witch, a murderer or thief. Both a thief and a murderer were hanging next to his son. Both had equal opportunity to ask for salvation. Only one did. What a mercy every day that he stays his judgment for those who do not deserve it, which is all of us. A murderer, a satanist, molester or rapist or thief do not deserve less mercy than us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As I said, His judgment is his mercy. And so when the tribulation starts and he opens the seals of judgment, it will be for the same purpose that he judged you and me in order, in our suffering, to bring us to cry out to him for mercy and return with our whole heart to him. And he will answer their cry through us, who just like them do not deserve any mercy. For whilst we were the enemies of God, he died for us. The prophet Isaiah married a woman of whoredom as a prophetic act to depict Israel's whoredom. Not only Israel, but all of the world is in fact a woman of whoredom. Isaiah 2 verse 14, Therefore behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. It's in our own personal wilderness that he has been speaking to us so that we can be that voice in the wilderness for them. It's through us that he will speak comfortably to them and it will require that we love them, that we will pray for our enemy, even the enemy who kills our loved ones. It will require a love that transcends that which is humanly possible. Who is sufficient for these things? How can I say it other than it will require you to be the real thing? When they look into your face, They will look into the face of God, just as his son was the full expression of the father. And just as Yeshua told Philip, when you see me, you have seen the father. And it is this very thing. He is working in you now. His love for them is so great that he was willing to have his son be slaughtered on a cross. His love for them is so great that he's willing to allow you to go through what you are going through in order to be that voice in the wilderness of mercy. His love for this world is so great that he has been long-suffering, meaning during all the time that he has not poured out his wrath on this earth, he has been suffering that which he has seen and heard in his holiness. And his mercy triumphs over judgment. I cannot but echo Paul's statement in Romans 11. Let's read that from verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, ye have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who have known the mind of the Lord? Who have been his counselor? Who have first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? 
For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. To be an intercessor is to stand between a righteous God's judgment and the guilty party. It means not only to plead for their life, to say, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy, but also to be a mercy. Mercy only finds its expression in a situation where it is not deserved. Can you show mercy in your present circumstances or do you have to have the last say? There is a time to speak and a time to keep silent. Do you have a learned ear to know the difference? Can you serve those who spitefully use you? Can you do it over and over and not just once? Will you be able to see as he sees into the suffering of not only the abused, but the abuser, like the drug addict and those who suffer because of that? God does not overlook sin, and he never has. But his mercy triumphs over judgment until that final last day comes of his final judgment. We are not to be guided by our opinion or prejudice, but instead to speak a word of judgment when he guides and to be a mercy to that same person as well. I was thinking the other day about how, how hard work prayer is. It is indeed to labor. Anybody who sets time aside to pray for others has to labor to go through the flesh, the outer court, that is to say, to be willing to sacrifice their time and put effort in. They then go through the veil into the inner court and there they have to deal with their unbelief, their possible unforgiveness and own hurt and doubt and then break through until both the flesh and and the soul is subject to the spirit where they meet with him at the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. The way has been made, but there is a coming into when we pray for others where true intercession is a sacrifice in itself and all that remains is a groan and crying for mercy. It is where the Spirit of God takes hold of your tongue and cries out to the Father with words that cannot be uttered. It takes a commitment to fast and pray for others and actively seek Him for them. And people do not know anymore how to do this. They do not know how to go into the closet and travail. They can say a prayer, but they do not know how to travail. They do not know how to be as Jacob and wrestle with God, saying, I will not leave you until you bless me. They do not know how to do this through the night. That is to say, when everything else screams, this is hopeless. They do not know anymore how to moan in the spirit and groan before God in travail. At best, they hope God will answer. But he is crying out for intercessors and by definition the word itself means a sacrifice. How many of our prayers for others constitute a sacrifice? For our children? Yes. But for those who reject you, abuse you and spitefully use you? Oh, that we would come to the knowledge of God that he longs for. He longs to save this world. Where are his priests? We are the ones who buy our time to cry out to him for others where it is no longer about them. We are those priests who has brought through so much suffering that now can pray with empathy who know that they are dust and that everything they have and do is a mercy. The appointed time of judgment is here and we need to cry out for mercy. Understand that all of your life, whatever you have gone through, has prepared you for this moment in time. It was P.T. Forsyth who said, At the beginning, we ever pray to live, but when we mature, we ever live to pray. All that Christ endured even the cross was so that he could ever live to intercede as our great high priest. Intercession is both prayer and a life laid down. In fact, true prayer is a life 
laid down. If you are a worker, then by definition, you are a priest. If then a priest, then you are an intercessor. Let us not neglect the crucial part of our call, which is to come to his mercy seat and to intercede. May you hear the cry of the Spirit coming from the Father's heart. I leave you lastly with a word that he gave me in September 2020, and it's called Come to the Mercy Seat. As the light, so the darkness, ever increasing. Shall those who are the light not mourn those who are in the dark? Shall those who were once darkness not bring to remembrance the mercy extended, not deserved? Will you not draw near to me in a time that I may be found, as Abram not pleaded with me for Sodom and Gomorrah? Yet my church do not mourn those who will see my wrath. As they have tasted me and found me to be good, the unjust, the rebellious and wicked will taste my wrath. Is this the priesthood I have called that feast at my table and bathe in the light of my glory, but do not enter to stay at my mercy seat, provided and cry out to me for those who are left outside? For it is my day, my great and terrible day. Yet my bride, my priests do not see. Having eyes to see, they do not see. Having ears to hear, they do not hear what the Spirit is saying. The Spirit is saying, Seek me whilst I may still be found. I stand at the door and knock. Do not be rebellious. Do not go in for your own sake only, but cry out to me, my children. Cry out to me whilst I am still to be found. For where would you have been if it was not for your high priest? As the priests so the people. Will you go in and cry for the lost, the broken? Will you come into where I've made a way, not only for your salvation, but for you as priests of God to cry out for the lost? Do you not see the hour? I have set my own clock. Indeed, the world has hers, but I am the Alpha and Omega. I determine the times and seasons. Will you not recognize the hour, the season? Therefore, Cry aloud, my priests, cry aloud, for the veil has been torn and I desire you to draw near in my son. He ever intercedes. Should you not? Come, my children, seek my face. Draw near to me with a humble and contrite heart. For who knows whether I will not indeed show mercy to those who do not deserve it, as I have even shown you, draw near to the mercy seat. Amen.